Good morning, I invite you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 18 as we study this parable from Jesus as we're going through a sermon series all about listening to the voice of Jesus, our good shepherd as his sheep, rather than listening to the lies that we tell ourselves or the lies that Satan puts into our hearts and minds to deceive us and pull us away from God's will for our lives. And this morning, the lie that we want to address with God's word is the lie that says, I should quit. So show of hands, anybody ever quit something? All right, so we're all in this together, all right? Now, sometimes quitting is good, right? Anybody ever quit a bad habit? Anybody tried? That's probably a more fair question, right? Like sometimes we have things in our lives like you need to stop doing this or I need to stop acting this way or speaking this way. I need to stop eating these things, whatever it might be, right? There are bad habits, there's bad behavior in our lives that whether we come up with the idea our own or someone that we know and trust tells us, we, you should quit that, right? So sometimes quitting is good. Sometimes quitting is good because maybe that relationship is completely unhealthy for us, right? Or, or maybe a position or a job that we're working in is unhealthy for us. When I was in college, I quit my first job. It wasn't the first job I ever had. It was just the first time I had quit a job. And I was working in a bookstore in the mall and I was pulled into my supervisor's office for our quarterly review. Anybody been through a quarterly review before and the joy that that brings? All right. And we sit down and, and the first part of it is you, you're supposed to self-evaluate your own performance. Anybody ever had that happen at work where it's like evaluate yourself and then they're going to evaluate you and you can compare the scores? Ever notice there's always a chasm between your scores and their scores, right? And so. I gave myself modestly good scores, all right? It wasn't perfect. It was on a scale of one to five. And I didn't give myself fives, but it was a lot of fours, right? To be fair. And then my supervisor revealed all of their scores. And there was no fours. There was no fives. I didn't even get a three, all right? It was bad. I was like, ah, oh, ones and twos. That's, that's a lot different than mine. So what my supervisor did was, let's create a plan. Anybody ever done that? Like you're supposed to quit a bad habit, so you make a plan to help you quit it, right? We're gonna make a performance improvement plan. Now I gotta tell you, as a college student with two months left in the semester, I had zero desire in my body, soul, spirit, and mind to improve at that job, okay? So, we come up with a plan, and she goes, what do you think of this? Now, mind you, I'm a young college student. I've never quit a job before. All I've ever heard about in terms of the business world of quitting is that you're supposed to give a two weeks notice. So I go, yeah, so I was just thinking, I mean, I love your plan. Like, what's a two weeks notice? Like, do I have to give two weeks notice to quit? <laughs> Which caught her off guard, to say the least. He's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, how does that work? Can I like just do that now? Cause this be like day one of the two weeks. And so on the spot, and she didn't accept the two weeks. <laughs> that was my last day of work. Okay, that's the short, all right. <laughs> I quit. Now, I didn't probably go about it the most professional way, but here's the reality is, it wasn't a healthy job for me, and I only had a, a couple months left of the semester before I was moving back home, so I wasn't gonna be there long anyway. So it was okay to quit, and it felt so liberating, right? Anybody ever quit something or walked away from something and you just, you feel super free in your soul because you're like, that was not good for me anymore, and now I can breathe, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? So sometimes quitting is the right decision, right? It, it, it's wise, it's good, it's healthy. Other times though, quitting, giving up, throwing in the towel, is not actually what we ought to do. And this is how Satan often works, right? Jesus in the Gospel of John says that, that when he speaks, he's always lying because that's, that's who he is and that's his native tongue, is, is telling lies. And Jesus says he's been a deceiver from the very beginning. If you read the scriptures carefully, what you'll see about how Satan works against God's children, against you and me, 
is that he's, he's very careful to make it sound, make his lie sound like a really good idea. He, he's very good at making it sound like a half-truth, right? And if you, if you really pay attention to the scriptures, oftentimes when he's tempting people, or especially when he's tempting Jesus, he's actually quoting half of scripture verses. He'll quote like the first half, and it would sound to us what? What? Some kind of makes sense, right? So this morning, I don't want to talk about the good quitting, right? Sometimes they're just things in life we, we got to say no to. We got to quit and give up. But what we want to talk about this morning is the lie when Satan comes and he kind of turns this idea of sometimes quitting can be freeing and good. And he makes it destructive in our lives or in the lives of the people that we're, we're called by God to love and serve. So a little bit of a harder question. You don't have to raise your hands on this one. Just reflect on it. Sometimes quitting is good, right? And we, we quit, we've all quit things and given up things or we've tried to give up and quit bad habits. But here's something I want you to consider and reflect on as we dive into God's word. Have you ever quit something that was actually good and you kind of regretted it? You're like, I shouldn't have given up. I should have persevered a little bit more. And see, that's how Satan works in our lives. He, he gets us to quit. He gets us to give up or think it's, it's, it's time to throw in the towel and throw up our hands and, and just I'm done with it because it's too much or it's too hard or it's too painful, despite it might actually being the thing that God has called us to do in order to love our neighbors and to serve them and to share the gospel with them. So in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, I want to start with this parable. And I love this parable because Jesus tells us right up front what it's all about. Anybody ever read something that Jesus said, thought to yourself, well, Jesus said it, so it must be good, but I don't get it, right? And sometimes that happens with his parables, right? Some of his parables he, ex he explains, and then some of them he just tells us, here's a parable. <laughs> we got to sit there like the, the apostles and go, what does this mean? But this parable is awesome because before he even tells it to us, he says, here's the whole point. And I really want you to write down, highlight, circle, memorize this Bible verse because it is so important to our faith as Christians. It's so important to your walk with Jesus because here's the reality of life. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to give up at some point. Even on the good things that you know, this is what God wants me to be doing. This is what Jesus wants me to do. This is what he has commanded in his word. You and I are sometimes just going to be worn out, exhausted, and we're just going to want to give up. And Jesus is giving you this parable, not Pastor Mark. This is Jesus giving you this word of encouragement where he says in Luke 18, verse 1, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So two things. What does Jesus want us to do? Pray and not lose heart. Pray and not give up. Even though Jesus himself knows it's going to be really hard sometimes, right? We're going to want to just say, hey, this is too much, Lord. I don't want to go through this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm worn out. And Jesus is saying, but here's my word to you. Don't lose heart. Don't quit. Don't give up. So here's the parable. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. So there's a woman who's gone through something difficult. She's been mistreated or whatever it might be. We don't know the details, but she's lacking justice. Another way of saying it for you and me is there's something going wrong in her life. The circumstances are not lining up the way she wants, and she's pleading for justice. She's pleading for things to change. How many of you can relate to that part? It's like, yes, right? Like, this is not the way things are going, or I want them to go for me or someone I love and care about. And so, like the widow, we cry out, right? We, we begin to bug somebody. <laughs> and sometimes through prayer, we're, we're crying out to God. And this is how it goes. For a while, he refused. Isn't that a bummer? Anybody hoped, wished for, prayed for something to change in your life or someone else's life that you cared for? 
a few of us. <laughs> the rest of you, you guys are doing great. Now, show of hands. How many of you have felt like that change was being refused? Yeah, all right. So that's what happens in life, right? We're praying, we're, we're crying out for justice, we're crying out for change or, or circumstances to be different, relationships to be healed, reconciliation, whatever it might be. And it feels like what? It's, it's being ignored, it's, it's being refused. And so what's the temptation? To, to quit, right? Just give up. Right? Now, here's the deal. I don't know, maybe it is, yeah, it is true for you, but I haven't met a lot of people who believe in Jesus and, and are faithfully crying out and, and praying for things that have just said out loud, I quit, like I did to my boss, right? I think it's a lot more subtle than that, the way Satan works in our hearts. I, I, I think he, he wants us to quit by losing heart, right? We don't just like give a resignation letter to God and be like, I'm done, right? We don't say out loud, I quit. I, I think the way it works is we get so kind of worn down, you know, worn out or heavy hearted, what do we do? Just kind of lose heart, right? Did everybody kind of feel that, right? It's not just like this blatant telling God, you know what, I'm done, I quit. I, I think it's more the way the Satan works in this is, Oh, we, we, we've been refused, like the widow, right? We, we feel like we're being ignored or, or it's going unanswered. And so what do we do is we lose heart. And we kind of just, that's how we kind of quit. We just kind of passively stop praying sometimes. You don't have to show hands, but I know I've done that in my life. I'm not proud of it where it's just simply, well, I've said enough prayers about it. How many more is going to make a difference? Anybody ever felt that way? Right? Just like, some of you are just bold enough to raise your hands, right? It's just, you kind of lose heart. You're like, I just, don't, I just don't know if another prayer is going to make a difference. I, I, and so we lose heart in this way. Another way I think we do it, we're facing a situation like the widow where it's like, hey, I'm crying out. I'm ha coming and, and it's being refused or I feel like I'm being ignored. It's not being changed is I've already tried that. Right, so how many of you have you ever been struggling, been or felt a little worn out, like losing heart, and so you go to a fellow friend or family member, a fellow believer for a word of encouragement, right? Like that's what the Bible tells us to do, and you tell them, I'm struggling with this. Anybody ever been bold enough to do that? And then they say, well, have you prayed about it? Anybody had that interaction? Just show a hand, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, thanks. But here's, here's the subtle way that Satan convinces us to quit. Our response becomes, yeah, I mean, I've already tried that. That's why I'm coming to you. Do you have any other solutions? Do you have any other suggestions or possibilities? Because I've tried that thing and it didn't work. So what do we do? We quit, right? We, we lose heart. We give up. I'm done with it. I've, I've, I've tried that. You know, it's interesting as... We keep reading the parable. The widow is this wonderful example of just being annoying. <laughs> That's how the judge is going to view it all, right? So afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, verse 5, yet because this widow keeps what? Bothering me. Just think about the language that Jesus is using. How many of you think that when you think of Jesus and the words that he says, they should all be like super proper and polite and churchy kind words. Anybody? And then you read what he actually says and you're like, oh, not so nice, right? Because what's the example? What did she do? And you know, you want to churchize it, right? That's not a word, but we churchify it, right? And we want to go, she kept praying. She kept humbly coming before the judge and making polite, res respectful requests. But what does Jesus say she did? She just kept bothering him. Right? Any of you ever been bothered by somebody's requests? Yes? No? Like all the parents are like, yeah. I'm still going to therapy for it, right? <laughs> right? And so we're all, we've all had that experience where it's like, you just want someone to be quiet. 
Just stop. And so what do you do? Anybody ever done this? You just cave in, right? You're just like, if you, if you will just leave me alone, <laughs> I will give you what you want. Who's ever done that with a fellow human being? You're just like, yeah. If you will just stop, <laughs> we'll do whatever you want. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening here. The judge is saying, I don't respect men. I don't fear God. Which means, I don't believe in God, I don't fear His authority over me at all, and I don't respect people, which means I think I'm better than them. But because she is so annoying with her request to get her to go away, I'm going to give it to her. Right? And this is what it says, He keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her t continual coming. Right? He's saying like, I just want her to shut up. Sorry. but <laughs> I just want her to go away. I just want her to be quiet. So what, what's your injustice? Okay, here you go. Now, here's the whole point. Remember verse 1? You say, always be praying and what? Not lose heart. So what is the widow an example of? Not losing heart, right? Always praying, just always knocking on the door, always going to the judge, always bringing your request, saying, you've kept saying no, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. And then she gets her answer. She gets her request. Now, here's the whole point. Sometimes when you are reading a parable from Jesus, he will use positive examples to illustrate what God is like. All right. So here's a good example. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the prodigal son? Right? The father in that story loves both his sons and welcomes them and gives them everything, right? He represents God in a positive way, the redeeming, loving father. Sometimes in the parables of Jesus, he uses negative examples to say, God is the opposite of that. And this is an example of that, right? In this story, you and I are meant to be who? The widow, right? Jesus is telling us, keep praying, don't lose heart, don't give up. And so we get this example of what that looks like. Now here's the thing. Who's the judge? God. Now, this is a, a wicked, evil judge. And so Jesus' whole point is saying, like, look, if a wicked, evil judge who doesn't love God and doesn't care about people will eventually give someone what they need through their prayers, how much more... Will your good heavenly father do for you with your prayers? Does that make sense? All right. So verse six, Jesus, the, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? That's you and me. Whoever belongs to Jesus, we're the elect. He's saying, well, won't God answer our prayers? And here's the hard part. Sometimes you have to actually be like the widow, right? <laughs> How many of you would prefer it if you only had to pray about it once and it was just taken care of? Anybody? Show hands. How many of you would prefer that over having to be the widow, right? <laughs> yeah, I would too. But there's a reality here, right? Jesus is saying, no, 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 I'm giving you an example to be like, and he's saying, be like the widow. Always be praying. Don't lose heart. Because you have a good and righteous judge. You have a good and righteous God who will answer the prayers of his elect. Now here's this tricky thing, right? The always be praying. Now if I was just to ask you personally, how many of you would say, I am always praying? Anybody? You're like, let me, like, a good amount of time, but, like, always sounds like what? A lot, right? <laughs> like, right? Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. Oh, good, you know that one. How many of you are obeying it? Without ceasing. So does that mean we just never say amen? Right? How many of you pray before a meal at a dinner table? Pray without ceasing. You'd be like, so when do we eat? Right? Like, is this, is this supposed to end at some point? 
I'm hungry. All right? Now, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you a Greek word. It's way too long and weird for you to write down. Just, right? The word for without ceasing is adialitos. And another way to translate it is to say, pray without quitting or giving up. So Paul's not giving us this ridiculous command of never stop praying, right? Like as soon as you say, dear Father in heaven, and you begin your prayer, it doesn't mean you have to keep going until Jesus comes back, right? Because that would be ridiculous and what? Impossible. What Paul is saying is what Jesus is teaching here is always be praying, which means like pray without quitting. Pray without giving up. Because what's the temptation? I've tried that before. Yeah, I've already prayed about it. Anybody ever said that? You kind of thought that? Yeah, man. Right. How many sermons about prayers can you handle, right? <laughs> You're like, Pastor, we've heard this one. I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's still good. It's from Jesus. Right? Luke 18, verse 1. Ought always to pray and not lose heart. The other way I think that we are tempted to lose heart is that we simply get discouraged. Right? Now, we're not told how long this widow kept coming to the judge, but we get the impression that it's a while because what does the judge eventually say? She's bothering me. She's annoying. I, I give up. Please stop making the request. Now, I want you to think about it, though. Like, if you are a friend of this widow, and you see her getting up every single day, going to the judge, being told no and refused, and coming home, and being disappointed again, there would be a temptation to what? Eventually tell her, you know, it's just not meant to be. Right? And we, we would have, like, I call them optimistically giving up statements, all right, in our culture, which is when one door closes, another one opens. You can tell your friends that are really negative because they change it from a door to a window, right? Like your optimistic friends are like, it's going to be another big door. And your negative, pessimistic friends are like, it's going to be a window. We might squeeze through it, but it's there, all right? What is that? We're trying to be optimistic about what? quitting <laughs> we're trying to be optimistic about giving up and about losing heart and saying yeah you know what that's just not working out but another one will open right how many of you think her friends were telling her that hey you know what this is just not meant to be it's not in the cards for you like this door is closing but don't don't you know I me mean, don't totally give up because you know god will open another one i've yet to find that bible verse in my bible but if you're around the widow, I mean, that would make sense, right? Day after day, I mean, the judge is wicked. Everybody knows the judge is wicked. He's not going to give you just. He doesn't care about you. He's told you no a hundred times. Why do you think 101 is going to be different? So the first way we quit is we just kind of lose heart. We get worn out. And the second way, I think we just get discouraged. It's, it's not worth it. It's not, it's not going to work out. It's time to just give up. Try something new. Right. So Jesus tells us this parable. And this woman gives us this wonderful example of not giving up, not losing heart. And it's all wrapped around, not in, well, if I get to a certain number of times, I'll get what I want. The encouragement, the, the ability to not lose heart is wrapped around who our God is. That's the whole point of the parable. Jesus is saying, here's how I want you to keep praying and here's how you can be like this widow and not lose heart. Because you have a God who hears your prayers, right? Verse seven, it will God, not God give justice to his elect who cry to him what day and night. So first of all, Jesus is acknowledging like, look, if you're the kind of person who you're going through a season where you're crying out day and night, you're not alone. You're not a crazy person. You're not going through something that nobody else has never gone through before. And Jesus is also making a promise of what? That when you and I are in those seasons and in those struggles of crying out day and night, who's listening? 
Verse 7 says, I'm going to read it again so you can get the answer right. I'm going to start making handouts. I think that'll be good. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to who? Him day and night. So when we're crying out day and night like the widow, who's listening? God. Right? So Jesus is saying, here's how you don't lose heart. You know who God is. You trust in who our God is. It's not just, well, I'll just give it another shot. I'm going to try harder. It's, oh, I'm trusting in who my God is and what he does. In Galatians chapter 6, the apostle Paul tells us to not grow weary in doing good, for eventually we will reap a harvest. <laughs> now, there's a key word there, Eventually. The whole point of this parable is don't lose heart. Keep crying out, what? Day and night. The widow has to keep going to the judge. But just like Jesus, the whole point that Paul is encouraging the church with of don't grow weary and doing good, don't grow weary and be discouraged and and what God has called you to do by loving and serving people is because we're gonna get a harvest, we're gonna see a harvest. God is gonna do a work. So whether it's we keep going to God in prayer, we don't lose heart. We keep doing what God has called us to do by loving and serving people with the gifts he's given us, we don't lose heart. According to Jesus and Paul, it all comes down to I trusting in who my God is. He's a good God who hears my prayers. He hears me crying out day and night. He works through me. He works through all the seeds that I'm planting to bring about a harvest. And so what I want to do is close with one of my favorite Bible passages, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's in your uh, bulletin. You can turn there in your Bible. And I know a lot of you tease me almost every week (laughs) about saying it's one of my favorites, but here's uh, why it's so special to me. So 2 Timothy is the last letter that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Um, And he's writing it to a young pastor. And essentially, Paul is under arrest, and he's essentially on his deathbed. He knows he's going to die soon. And so he's writing this letter to a pastor. But what we talked about last week in terms of that we are all gifted by the Holy Spirit, right? We're all called into ministry as soon as we believe in Jesus. I want you to hear this as not just an encouragement for pastors, because pastors have ministry, but as an encouragement for all of us. Because we're all part of the ministry of God. We're all part of what God is doing through his church. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 7. The Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Anybody familiar with that line? Right? Especially, I think the fought the good fight of faith is a popular line, right? So when I was in seminary, which is... uh, (laughs) one of the biggest epicenters for spiritual warfare. And if you don't ever go to seminary, you kind of don't understand what I mean by that. But um, one of the biggest times of my life, and I know a lot of pastors, there are times of life where they were under the most stress and struggle from Satan was when we were at seminary studying to be pastors. So basically every seminary student thinks that they should quit. <laughs> and I don't mean like, Oh, man, Greek and Hebrew is hard. I should give up. I mean, every single student thinks at some point, at least once a quarter, probably, I should quit not just seminary, but ministry. I should just quit what Jesus has called me to do. Anybody ever felt like that at certain times in your life where Jesus has gifted you? He's called you to love people, serve people, do something. You're just like, yeah, this is tough. I'm done. So I called one of my mentors. There's a pastor I grew up under, uh, Pastor Michael Newman. He's president of the Texas district now. And he's also the guy that forced me to start learning Greek because he thought it would be funny. Um, (laughs) And so I called him up, you know, and I was in tears. And I was just like, I'm done, man. Like, this is pointless. Like, what, 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 why am I going through this? Right. So I don't know if you could relate to that in your life where you're just like, what's the point of still trying to do this or go through this, right? And he goes, well, Mark, you've been reading your Bible? I said, yeah, I go to class. Bible's everywhere. And that's when he um, challenged me of reading Bible. By the way, if you are unaware, the 
the biggest temptation and struggle for seminary students is that our Bible becomes our textbook. And so the Bible becomes your homework lesson every single day. So you get to read it for devotion, and we have to read it for a test. So what he was asking me was, are you actually listening to God's word? Are you listening to the voice of Jesus, which I've been encouraging you to do in this sermon series? I was like, yeah, you know, kind of. Like, anybody ever try to, like, wiggle out of something? You're like, oh, you know, classes, we got it all. It's right there. And eventually I had to tell them, no, not really. I'm not listening to God's word. I'm not being in God's word. I'm not being refreshed by it. So he told me a few passages to read. One of them was 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then because he likes messing with me, he goes, but Mark, here's what I want you to do. And I was like, please don't say it. <laughs> I want you to read it in Greek. And I was like, why, you, why do you hate me? <laughs> I was calling for you to lift me up. So, I, and eventually we talked about it. And I, I mean, I, I read it in Greek and then I called him and talked to him about it. He's like, did you figure it out? I was like, yeah, I think so. So there's this line, it says, I have fought the good fight, right? I fought the good fight of faith. And it sounds, what? It sounds really brave, right? It sounds really courageous, like, oh, of course. How many of you can read that and you go, well, of course, Paul, apostle, fought the good fight of faith and didn't give up. Why? Because he's what? He's Paul the apostle, right? And I'm just me. And so here's the thing. Uh, the Greek words for I fought the good fight is agonizo. It's where we get our English word agony or agonize. So what Paul is actually saying is I've agonized the good agony. You can also be like I struggled the good struggle. So what he's saying is like, look, sometimes man, life is really hard. There's illness, there's loss, there's sin, and there's temptation. And the temptation that Satan wants to use against us, and deceive us with, is to what? Quit. Lose heart. Give up in the struggle, right? Just say, tap out of the fight, right? Just like, okay, that hit was way too hard. I'm done now. But I, I love that what Paul is saying. is like, no, I've agonized the good agony. Because it sounds real, right? Anybody ever been through an agonizing moment in life and wrestled with God and really struggled, right? And Paul says, but I kept, what? The faith. I kept trusting in God even in the middle of the what? The agony, the fight, the struggle. And so he, what he's doing is he's writing to Timothy, he's writing to the church, he's writing to you and to me, and he's giving his name as I finished the race, I've kept the faith. And verse eight, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And then here's the part that's good news for you and me. And not only me, not only Paul, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So show of hands, how many of you love Jesus? Good. He's talking about you. So Paul's acknowledging, look, you, there's gonna be agony. <laughs> there, there's gonna be a struggle, there's gonna be a fight. And Satan's gonna want you to lose heart, to give up. And he's saying, but here's the hope. It's not because Paul is so amazing and wonderful and braver than you. He's saying, no, here's, here's the hope that I was holding on to the whole time is that the Lord is gonna give me a crown of righteousness. He's saying the Lord is gonna give me eternal life. And so for you and me, just like the widow and just like Paul, the way that we fight back against Satan and his lies and the way we listen to Jesus and keep praying and don't lose heart, is that we hold on to our faith in who God is, trusting that no matter what the agony looks like, no matter what the struggle or the fight looks like for our own lives, ultimately he's gonna give us the crown of eternal life. So here's my hope and prayer for you. It's Luke 18, verse one, because I, I can't really say it better than Jesus. That they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's my hope and prayer for you, that you will keep praying whatever the agony, whatever the struggle, whatever the fight is, that you will not lose heart because of you know who God is and he's gonna give you eternal life. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have given us this word of encouragement for this life, that no matter what our agony, our struggle, our fight is, that we can trust in you. We can continually cry out to you day and night, knowing that you hear us and you answer us. And that ultimately, just like the Apostle Paul, we will receive the crown of righteousness, the crown of eternal life, because of your great love and grace for us. In your name we pray. Amen.